Davis steps under center. Gibson and McClendon behind it. Davis with motion by Richard. Will get the ball to McClendon. He leaps. Oh, he doesn't get in. He fumbled the football. Carolina holds. The game is over. And Carolina has won the game. Ben lead to throw. Over the middle. Intercepted. Wolfuck again. Wolfuck the other way. At the 30. The 40. Wolfuck to midfield. Miles Wolfuck with the pick. The heels on the doorstep of an enormous victory. Left side of the line. Hood standing to Williams' is right. Williams going to throw. One-on-one. Davis has it. Touchdown. Carolina wins. Carolina is the Coastal Division champion. Bernard fields it at the 26. Heading to the far side. Gio at the 35. Gio, he's at the 50. No, he's not. Yes, he is. Gio is going to take it for a touchdown. for the possible win. Snap, spot, kick away, high enough, long enough. It's good! It's good! Carolina has won the game on a 42-yard field goal by freshman Hunter Burr. Good gosh, dirty. This is the Heel Tough Blog Hey guys, and welcome in to another edition of the Heel Tough Blog Podcast, as well as the Four Corners Podcast. Today, we are doing a dual episode of the podcast because we are talking to a guy that most of you guys probably know currently as the voice of the Carolina Panthers. He is getting ready to step away and retire at the end of this upcoming season, but he was also a guy that from 1989 to 2005 was part of the Tar Heel Sports Network. It is Mick Mixon who is stopping by with us, and first of all, well, Mick, uh, congratulations on the retirement, man. I know you're looking forward to uh, being able to get out there, enjoy some farm life after uh, this illustrious career that you've had. But uh, you know, I, I, I we talked to you a little bit about it. It's uh, it's got to be pretty humbling for you to be able to hear, you know, some of these people that uh, have been sharing some of their memories of you over this time uh, and the impact that you've made on their lives over the last thirty years. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Mike, I don't even have the words for any of this, Anthony. I, um, I was caught very much by surprise by the article that Darren Gant wrote on Panthers.com. I thought, I mean, he sat down and we talked a little bit, of course, but I thought it was just going to be a little blurb about I've decided to uh, to retire at the end of this season. But he said so many nice things, and then some other people have, have chimed in. I'm sure there's the other side of it, too. One reason I don't go on the Internet, I, I've never Googled myself and never will, is because you can go out there and get your feelings hurt pretty quickly uh, if that's what you uh, – are looking to do but i just have always believed that what i wanted for my life was number one all i ever wanted to be was a sports broadcaster number two i didn't want to be one of those guys or girls that that overstayed i've oh i've been so fortunate i've had great jobs and i've loved every second of it but I've never wanted to be one of those cats that's, you know, you lose your fastball, you're trying to hang on, you're, you become this, this caricature of a sportscaster. I think it's just, just I just feel it. I, I have for several years now. I've been kind of planning this, and so I'm tremendously excited for this season. Not for anything that has anything to do with me, but the story is going to be the 2021 Carolina Panthers full stadiums training camp at Wofford, and I think this team's going to be a handful. Uh, So, yeah, you know, tell us how you got into the broadcasting field because, you know, you uh, you end up going to Carolina. You grew up in Chapel Hill. But what got you sort of that in that broadcasting bug and made you want to get into the industry that uh, you've you pioneered in this in this area for a while now? First thing I had to realize was that I was not going to be the starting quarterback. I was not going to be uh, the championship uh, point guard on the, the title team or any of that. And to realize that, I had to realize that my mother had smoked so many cigarettes and drank so much bourbon during my gestation that I was cheated out of the genetic material that was going to propel me to a great career on the field. And once I realized that, I was probably maybe 10 years old and, you know, my parents would pat me on the head and say, oh, Mickey, don't worry. You know, your father was a late bloomer, too. But I realized that there wasn't going to be really any blooming to speak of. So then I thought, well, how can I 
how can I be around sports? Because it was just an intoxicating idea to me that an athletic team, if you couldn't be on it, there had to be a way to get close enough to it where you could still tell the stories. And so ever since I was about 10 years old, I, I, I wanted to be a sports broadcaster, and it's all I've ever thought about doing for a career. Hey, Mick, this is Josh, the co-host of the Heel Tough Blog podcast and then the host of the Four Corners podcast. As Anthony mentioned, you grew up in and around Chapel Hill, and you got to work with longtime UNC great Woody Durham. I want to know, what was your first impression your first meeting with the legendary UNC sports broadcaster? Good hearing your voice, Josh. Thank you for your question. I knew of Woody before Woody knew about me. I, I was a kid growing up in Chapel Hill, and as I've said before also, I did not grow up in the Great Depression, but my father tried to simulate it at 2313 Honeysuckle Road. So when I was 15, I rode my bicycle down to WCHL Radio, flagship station on the Tar Heel Sports Network, and made an appointment with, I had made an appointment with Tom Taylor, who was the production director back then, the PD, like we used to call it, to try to get a job. And I was able to get a job running the board. And part of what I ran the board for was UNC games. So I got to be the one to hit the button when Woody dramatically intoned, let's pause 10 seconds for station ID on the Tar Heel Sports Network. I was the one that hit the button that played the ID and sent it down the line to all the affiliated stations. Oh, man, I could not imagine a better gig. So there were a couple times that I, I crossed paths with Woody, and he seemed to be this mythical character back then. When I was a kid, Woody Lombardi Durham seemed superhero-like, like he like he walked into the room with his knuckles dragging on the floor and you know, crushed small children and animals and other broadcasters with each step he took. I did not realize until later that there was a sensitive side to him and uh, just an amazing guy and miss him so much. And I can fill a small book with what I learned from Woody, even when he wasn't really trying to teach me anything. Well, you were also alongside a guy that's had pretty good success himself, the guy who has taken over as the voice of the Tar Heels, Jones Angel. You know, you guys were you know coming up around the same time. What do you kind of remember about Jones, and, and what is your relationship like today? Jones Angel, Monroe v. Jones Angel the Fourth is one of my best friends, and I'm much. Thank you for your comments, but I'm much older than Jones. <laughs> I was t teaching a journalism class in the School of Journalism at UNC. I did that for about eight or nine years. I taught a sports writing class and also a topics in sports journalism class at UNC. And this little kid, fresh faced little kid from out of Jacksonville, North Carolina, shows up on the front row of my class. And I saw in him, and I'm not saying this is a good thing. I'm just going to tell you how I felt. I saw in him a younger, uh, a little bit of a younger Mickey Mixon in this kid, just in terms of the enthusiasm he had, the way he asked questions of the speakers I brought in. The quality of his writing was very, very good. And so I reached out to him with my octopus-like tentacles and got him into the, into the queue as an intern. Because as you know, you guys both know, maybe you've been interns or you've hired some. You need those grunt workers to edit tape and to go get chicken and and pick you up at the airport and all those cool things. So I hired Jones as an intern, and he was unbelievable. I mean, he learned how to do the, use the digital editor. He, was, he ended up being the one, and this is a formula for success in life its own self. He made himself indispensable. He learned how to fix the coffee machine, fix the copier, fix the, uh, the, the anything that went wrong. He, he could learn how to use the digital editor and edit with. So you'd look around and go, well, this stuff's great, but who's going to edit it? I don't, I don't know. Well, Jones, here, you do it. And so I'm so proud of him and his many successes, and I cherish my relationship with him. We talk all the time. Mick, you mentioned that you learned a lot from Woody Durham without him maybe directly teaching you. His preparation is legendary, but what other lessons did you learn from Woody that you carried into the broadcast you did with him and then when you moved on and worked for the Carolina Panthers? I learned about journalistic balance, and Woody believed that the game deserved to be called in a full, fair, accurate way, even though – no State fan, no Duke fan, no Virginia fan, no Wake fan ever, nobody ever questioned Woody's loyalty. He was fiercely loyal to UNC and to the coaches and players. But he believed that you had to prepare 
just as hard for the enemy, for the opponent. And he believed that you, you that when the opponent did something good, when it was an exciting play, that that uh, that, that that deserved a high vocal register to describe that. Woody would sometimes get criticized for uh, being sounding too excited if. Kenny Inge of NC State came in and dunked over Stackhouse, or if um, if Duke, uh, if Cherokee Parks made a great play, or if you know you could do it was a hundred examples. Woody would sometimes get criticized for calling touchdowns, big plays uh, from the p- opponent in an excited way, but he believed in doing it that way, and but of course he saved his most exciting calls for when UNC did it, and I just thought that was so cool. I mean he. He, he respected the, the faith and trust that people placed in him enough to where he tried to call the game in, in a way that if even if you hated Carolina, even if you hated Woody and you hated his parents for having him and you hated their parents for having them, <laughs> you could still listen to the game and get the story. Well, hey, you know, you were on campus. You come in uh, 1989 was your first year with the Tar Heel Sports Network. So a lot of your time on the football front overlapped with Mac Brown. And, you know, he's trying to build Carolina back into, uh, you know, one of those teams that can be right on the outside of competing for a national championship. But that's where he was when he was there during that time. And then, of course, in 1997, he ends up leaving and going on to Texas. What do you remember about the mindset around Carolina football during that time and and was there a real thought on campus that this was a team that could challenge for national championships in the sport of football oh yes those were oh man just halcyon days when Mac Brown had it going and when he went in when Mac Brown went into every high school in North Carolina over 300 high schools got an in-person visit from um, from either Mac Brown or from a member of his staff. Now, remember the prior staffs, the prior staff under Dick Crum had not, and let's see, who's the coach? The Mac t- took over from Crum. Is that how the chronology went? Yeah, Mac took over from Crum, who took over from Bill Dooley. From Bill Dooley, right. So, so Bill Dooley understood recruiting. Dick Crum brought in a lot of good players but and had some good teams, but somehow or another, the, the high school football coaches in the, in our state didn't seem to feel as warmly towards the Dick Crum staff, and so Mac Brown realized that, and he sent he sent people even if they didn't have a prospect. So if you're out there at Black Mountain High School and you and you hadn't won a game in three years and you don't have a Division three guy on your team, you still got a visit from somebody from UNC saying, "Call me if you need me. Here's my card." We're, we want to make sure that the, the homegrown talent stays at home. So when Mac Brown, when the Tar Heels started to get talented and started to get good, this my, one of my favorite teams of college football teams of all time was the 1990 Tar Heels that went six four and one. That was a hard earned. I mean, that was a tough football team. They had Georgia Tech, Stone Georgia Tech four times at about the one yard line this unbelievable goal line stand to tie the, the yellow jackets that would then go on and, and uh, share the national championship that year. And that was the foundation. That was a foundational team. And, and it was, I just was heart sick. And, and when Mac Brown left, I understood why he might want to, and, and it turned out well for coach Brown and it'd been great that he's back in, in Chapel Hill. But yeah, that was a uh, man, just it's hard not, to, it was hard not to think back then of where Carolina football could have gone had he stayed. Well, after he left, Carolina did have a once in a generation type player, a guy that uh, you know was in you know multiple races uh, for the Heisman Trophy in his time on campus, and it was all while being a defensive end. That was, of course, Julius Peppers. He goes on after his illustrious career at Carolina and plays for the Carolina Panthers, and you got to call a lot of his time in Carolina. How cool was that overlap for you to be able to watch him like you did at the college level, call his games, and then to be able to move on to the NFL and be able to talk about him for years to come after that? I loved it, and I feel like I was not not the only one, but I feel like I was on to Julius early. And that is what I mean by that is I could see early on that he's smart and layered and sensitive and 
but yet he's not comfortable with the, the adoration, with the spotlight, with the intrusive eye of the media and the public. And I even talked to him about it and have since then is saying, Julius, you, you know, you, um, there have been times when he was with the Panthers when I'd interview him and I would remind him, I said, okay, Julius, it's Mick. So I know, I know your tricks. So don't give me any of these one word answers. Don't give me, I don't want introspective Julius. And he would comply with that. I mean, I would have, I would ask him about song lyrics, songs he was listening to, books he had read, uh, beliefs he had about this issue or that. And I mean, it's un- unreal to hear him talk once he feels comfortable enough around you to deal himself out in a little more open way. In addition to his great play on, on the football field, he also was a very good basketball player. And we had a chance to talk to Matt Doherty a couple summers ago and said that if Julius wanted to play in the NBA, he could have. What do you remember about Julius Peppers, the basketball player, when he was on campus at Carolina? I'll never forget, as long as I live, we, uh, we're, at, we're at Buffalo. Somehow or another, the Tar Heels schedule a game at Buffalo. And you can imagine it looked like Jack Nicholson in The Shining. I mean, you just a snow, and you just expect Jack Nicholson to come out from around the tree and 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 say, "Here's Johnny." And uh, it was just this gloomy theater up there. But late in the game, the Tar Heels had it in hand. So late in the game, Peppers comes off the bench, and there's a loose ball tapped ahead. Pepper scoops it up and jumps from about not the free throw line, but a little bit inside the free throw line. And and the ball cuffed in his left arm. And he rose up and he rose up and he rose up again. And he went, I mean, I guarantee, I bet you his, he almost hit his head on the rim. He's way up into the air. And I mean, boom! And he just jackhammered the ball into the goal. And I, I, I tried never to, you don't want to out, try to out Woody Woody. You can't do it. I tried very carefully when I was the color analyst to just do the color. But I couldn't help myself in this moment. And I went, whoa. And I just I yelled out with some sound and jumped up out of my chair. Unlike me, very unlike me in those moments. But just to see that bulk and that girth and that amount of what body weight spring that high into the air with that left-handed cuff dunk is incredible. Well, you look, you, you got a chance to call two national championships when he, when, when you were uh, with the Tar Heels. And, you know, both of them, I, I guess, were, you know, definitely special in their own different ways. Um, but, you know, what do you remember most about that 2005 one? Because I feel like that one was definitely a roller coaster ride from your guys' perspective just a couple of years earlier. You know, this was a program that a lot of people were kind of wondering what direction they were going in. You end up getting, uh, you know, Roy Williams to come back, and in two short years, he ends up winning the national championship. What do you remember about that night in St. Louis and that national championship banner uh, that Carolina earned that night? I remember that how that team had just the ball handling ability of that team. That team could, one through five, that team could catch, could pass, could face, could shoot. There was nobody that you could play off of. I mean, you, you pretty much had to, you pretty much had to switch on all screens. You pretty much had to get up on shooters, uh, which opened up some 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 duck and dish uh, opportunities for that team because of how. I mean, Sean May could 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 pick and pop. I mean, all of them could. They were just good basketball players. All of them were just good, just good basketball players. And uh, that team um, had that psychological hardness that you want to see in a championship team, and really kind of mirrored the combative spirit of of Coach Roy Williams in powering through the championship. One of my favorite Woody Durham calls is in that 2005 game against Duke where Marvin Williams gets the loose rebound and hits a bank shot and gets fouled, and the Dean Dome went absolutely crazy. Take us through that moment as you were sitting at that broadcast table beside Woody Durham and what you felt when he hit the bank shot to race a nine-point deficit and give Carolina that lead. Couldn't believe it. You start thinking, really, just a minute or two before, you start thinking, okay, well, how am I going to describe how, – how how's the post-game show going to sound – with with a, a loss here to to Duke, and it just looked like it had loss stamped all over it. And back then, we we did we sat at courtside. We had been we had broadcast for a few years in the Smith Center, up, up right under the concourse, up on the concourse level in a booth they had for us. But we'd moved down to the court, and the noise 
th- th- that was the loudest I ever heard the Smith Center except one other time. Do you remember the game when Rodel coaxed in a three to bring the Tar Heels down from 20, I think it was 22 points against Florida State? Yes. I mean, that comeback – and the Marvin Williams shot. Those were about the two loudest times that I felt like I ever heard the Dome of Dean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean that was a, a, that was definitely a, a crazy moment. And uh, you know, when when you look at at you know overall your time on campus at Carolina, uh, you know, are there any other memories that really stick out from you? And, and what do you remember the most about your time there with all the different personalities that you got to, uh, you know, meet and, and, and work with during that time? Is there any others that really stick out uh, from your time? Oh, gosh. I mean, it was a I was there for 16 seasons, so a big part of my uh, my life as growing up, to, as a young kid in Chapel Hill and then working there for a decade and a half, it would take me, we don't have another, there are not enough podcast minutes available, but just in a crucible, uh, I think that uh, I, I will never forget that I, I didn't know how to really be a color analyst. I had only done play by play. So I tried to educate myself in the rules of the sports. And so Nobody really cares about this or maybe even knows about it, but you ask me, some, I'll tell you. I went to the ACC football officiating clinic every year for 16 seasons. These officials welcomed me in, Courtney Mosey, Tommy Hunt, Ted Jackson, uh, Ernie Cage. I mean, there's their, 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 they go, their names go on and on and on. Uh, Joe Long. I mean, this was a Clark Gaston. This is an amazing group of men. And they. I was the only media that – and I, this was curious to me because I thought, why, why, why isn't everybody here? Why aren't color analysts for TV and radio all around the league? Why aren't this is great? I mean, you got to know college rules are different from high school rules, and they're different from pro rules. And so, to learn about the exceptions, to learn about the mechanics, the points of emphasis, the rule changes for each season, and it was always at a different ACC school. So I'd, I would go to fly down to Florida State or drive up to College Park, Maryland, and every. You know, in 16 seasons, visit every campus in a weekend in late July. And so just to be a, a, a to have that fraternity of guys welcome me in and let me learn. That's one of the things that I'll take from my time there that that I'm so thankful for it and, and, um, and proud of. Well, hey, it definitely paid off for you, Mick. You have had a tremendous career both at Carolina and here with the Carolina Panthers. We are looking forward to your final season. I know uh, over at WFNZ we'll talk to you multiple times throughout the year, but thanks for taking some time and talking to us here. We're uh, definitely not on the same level as WFNZ for sure, uh, but we're glad that you're able to give us a little bit of time here uh, to talk about your time at Chapel Hill. Well, the honor of this visit has been all mine, of course. And Josh and Anthony, thank you for uh, for, for ha- having me on for a few minutes. And I hope my uh, answers to your questions were, were worthy of the high standards of your show. <laughs> they were tremendous, man. <laughs> we're looking forward to uh, that final year. Enjoy the ride, man. And then uh, enjoy that time that you'll have after that up in Alamance County with you and uh, your, your beautiful family. All right, man? Yeah, my little shorty and me, man, we're going to be out there to live in some farm life. So, But you just call me if you need me. There you go. All right, right, Mick. Thanks Thanks so much, man. Okay, see you. Bye. So, both myself and Josh want to thank Mick Mixon for stopping by with us. Just phenomenal stuff with him and uh, wish him the best in his final season with the Carolina Panthers as they get ready to race through the 2021 into the 22 season. Uh, It will be his final in the booth for the Panthers and it should be an exciting one. If you're one of those crossover fans from the Tar Heels to the Panthers on Sundays, make sure that you check out Mick throughout the season on on the Panthers radio network. And so that wraps it up for this edition of the podcast. Make sure you guys head over to the website, HeelToughBlog.com. Check out all the latest that we've got on the website for you. Uh, tons of recruiting stuff on there on both sides of the aisle, whether you want the latest on the football recruits. Carolina had a big weekend on the football recruiting trail. They have another big one coming up this weekend. Uh, and man, it, this was a big weekend for uh, the Tar Heels this past weekend on the football trail with the guys that were on campus 
campus. Jake Pope, uh, as well as Sebastian Cheeks, Jaden Lucas, uh, the guys that officially visited. Of course, you had Zach Rice uh, on the first day that he was allowed to be on campus. He stopped by. So we have updates on that on the website. We have a stock report that we're putting up here. And uh, hopefully we're going to be able to do that going forward for the next group of guys that will be on campus as well. This weekend doesn't appear to be as packed as this past weekend or the next uh, two weekends after that, but we'll still have you covered on that front. Basketball, of course, Will Shaver committed to Carolina after his visit to campus. So Josh has an article up there about that. He's also got you updated on all the guys that had visited campus this past weekend and the guys that will be visiting campus over the next couple of weeks. So make sure you go and check that out on the website, HeelToughBlog.com. When it comes to the podcast, uh, there's plenty of ways to listen to the podcast. You can uh, check it out, Spreaker, iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts is iTunes instead, Uh, Google Podcasts as well. There's plenty of places to check it out wherever you can listen to your podcast. You can check out the Heel Tough blog podcast. And when you do, make sure that you rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast for us. The main thing is that you subscribe because that's for you. We want you guys to be able to get all these great additions of the podcast. We've got plenty more interviews coming up. Former players are going to be stopping by with us. Uh, There's a couple other special things that we have in the works uh, on the podcast side of things. And then, of course, during the season, as we've been telling you guys a little bit over these last couple of weeks, we are planning to go back into video forms of the podcast. So we will be on camera again. We're going to have the graphics for you, everything like that for our players of the week, all that kind of stuff. So that's going to be back. We did get our studio back, so it'll look more professional as well like it was early in the season last year and some of the preseason stuff that we did as well. And that's when it's going to start again this year. When we start doing the preseason stuff, which will be done a little bit different this year as well, we're going to go a little more in depth. You guys will be able to check all of that out via video. We'll be on there, uh, clean ourselves up, make ourselves look good on camera for you guys, and you'll be able to check it out throughout the season on there. So we're extremely excited about everything on that front. And the best way to check out those video editions of the podcast will be on the Facebook page. We encourage you to go there, like and follow the Facebook page. That's where you get access to all of the different Uh, pieces of content that we have for you. We've got the website that you guys can check out. Uh, All those articles will be on the uh, Facebook page. Uh, Same thing with all of the regular editions of the podcast. And then the video editions of the podcast will be on there as well. That's the big reason why if you go and follow the Twitter page, we encourage you to do that. But mainly, we want you to follow that Facebook page because when we put the video editions on Twitter, when we share those, it's going to take you back to that Facebook page. So you might as well like and follow that Facebook page while you're there. Uh, We greatly appreciate that, and it'll go a long way to helping you guys see those exciting editions of the podcast that we'll have coming up. So that wraps it up for this edition of the podcast. want to thank Mick Mixon for stopping by with us. want to thank Josh for co-hosting with me. want to thank you guys for listening and... And as always, go Tar Heels!